Good morning everyone. It is my proud privilege to start today's session of pediatric laparoscopic surgery. I will be covering uh, some of the basic aspects of pediatric, pediatric laparoscopy and thoracoscopy for beginners. And as you can see in the program that the subsequent uh, speakers will be covering on the advanced aspects of similar topic. Before I be begin my talk, I would like to sincerely thank and congratulate the team of uh, MAMC uh, who has been holding these update programs and they are of tremendous benefit to all our pediatric surgery training all across the country and uh, really helps them a lot. So congratulations to them. So uh, when you are told that you have to present it in front of a beginner and you have to delve into the basic aspects, uh, I would always question that whether this beginner is a person who is like a fresh entry resident who is beginning his training or who is an experienced open surgeon and, and he's just now entering into area of pediatric laparoscopy and is trying to learn the basics. Whatever the scenario is, I would make my best effort to cover most of the basic aspects of pediatric laparoscopy. And uh, uh, with this, we will be covering with the MS basics and some of the insights related to various procedures which are attempted by laparoscopic surgeons. So this slide, this particular slide shows you the various components of learning which you have to go through when you begin your journey towards the learning of pediatric laparoscopic surgery. You are, most of us are coming from the adult world. We may have assisted a few adult laparoscopic surgery, done a few. When you enter into a pediatric laparoscopic surgery field, you have to unlearn a lot of things because the concepts are very different. The applied anatomy is different and you have to be really be clear about it. The setup and the ergonomics are very different. The entire setup of laparoscopic surgery is, is involving a lot of equipment. There is a lot of clutter inside the OT and you have to set up everything according to the advantage of your procedure and uh, so that you can uh, maximize your effort inside the abdomen rather than focusing on the outside. Port placement and optics are another important aspects of basics of pediatric laparoscopic surgery we will be covering in our subsequent slides. There are several toys and tools which you will be using during the procedure of laparoscopic surgery such as harmonic energy sources, staplers and various other things which you can uh, get and then you need to understand that which tool should be used in which particular circumstance so that it gives you the maximum benefit and advantage. Apart from all these components of learning, once you have, once you are comfortable, you will have to see your setup, you will have to see the hardware that is available to you and then you will have to try and understand what your team can do and based on that you will attempt a particular procedure. So in the beginning uh, of the learning you would be attempting a pediatric, you know, so in the beginning you may be attempting a pediatric laparoscopic cholecystectomy or an appendicectomy but as your training advances, the people around you are also learning, your cameraman is trained, your staff nurses are trained, you can go on to attempt more complex procedures. So it is very important to understand that what your team can do and what you should attempt. Start with the basic ergonomics uh, as I had showed in the, in, in the previous slide where you, you are trying to learn the port, ergonomics, the equipment and the uh, other things which are there. So you set up the entire thing according to the advantage, according to the mechanical advantage. I have kept this slide as first because this is something which you will have to discuss actually a day before your procedure. So the basic concept is that the surgeon should be facing the organ without twisting his spine and the surgeon S for surgeon, C for camera, O for organ, P for picture. Picture means the display monitor which is there in front of you. So the S, C, O, P should all be in a straight line. So what it does is that all these, if all these four components of the entire uh, setup is in a straight line it will decrease the parallax and it will avoid you to twist your back and increase your efficiency. Parallax is something which is, which is the enemy of hand-eye coordination and the depth perception and every effort should be made to reduce the parallax. If everything is put in one single straight line, you will have the minimum amount, amount of parallax while you are operating. So you have to set up with this particular kind of arrangement. Few more words about the ergonomics, more setup related advice in terms of ergonomics. The patient is here positioned on the upper half of the table and rest of the components of the, uh, uh, of the entire setup are there in front of you. The scrub nurse is there, the scrub trolley is there, the surgeon assistant is there and the main operating surgeon is there. So here uh, the entire thing is uh, the surgeon and his assistant are on one side and the rest of the stuff is on the other side and uh, at times it is little difficult and most of the time it results in twisting of your back. So the best way if you're doing an upper abdominal surgery is to bring the patient all the way down at the lower end of the table and you may slightly abduct uh, the, the legs if, if it is a, a small child. It may be difficult in, in a bigger child but uh, most of the time you will be able to do this. And then big, bring everything in one line, the surgeon goes down and stands at the foot end of the table. So once he stands on the foot end of the table, the advantage which he gets is that he is able to move in an arc and it gives him a greater degree of freedom to move across the table 
and with that he will always be able to achieve the scoop single line scoop uh, which i described in the previous slide position principle so position principle means that while you are operating uh, how comfortably you are standing so in order to understand the position principle of a surgeon uh, you have to understand the pianist position where you imitate the pianist you can see that the pianist is standing here the elbows are at the uh, key level and then his shoulders are also relaxed the same thing is applies to to a surgeon where he is standing with the instruments in his hand which are almost at the elbow uh, the table is at the elbow level and the shoulders are relaxed and he is looking at the monitor and not looking up too much up or too much down so as to put the strain in the uh, surgeon's neck or the shoulders so the how would a bad position look like you can see that in this position the instruments are wide apart his arms are abducted the shoulders are shrugged and you are sitting is standing in a bent down position so you may be able to do any procedure in any of the position but it's a matter of how relaxed you are while you are operating the more relaxed you are the more comfortable position you are in the better the efficiency of your procedure is going to be there and you are not going to end up with a sore neck or a sore back at the end of the procedure and the entire stamina of the surgeon uh, is better with a comfortable position ports now ports is is a sort of a vantage point of a soldier who is in a field so if that soldier is wrongly placed and if he is firing from a wrong uh, wrongly placed position he is not going to hit his target the same thing applies to the port that if the ports are properly placed in accordance with the angle where he gets the maximum degree of freedom then he will be able to do the procedure in a better efficient way so we follow the principle of the port kite we all know that uh, the umbilicus is a constant point where you will be placing the camera and then there is a organ of interest there is an organ of interest uh, which is there in front of you and with that you will place your two left hand and right hand port in a way so that the long axis of the two instrument is almost at the level of 90 degrees to each other it may or may not be uh, exactly 90 degrees it may be a little less because most of the time our patients are very very small so but you should this is what you should try to achieve and it is always better to err on the side of spacing out the ports rather than crowding them so here uh, we often draw diagrams i will be coming to this aspect in the subsequent slides it is always better to draw the organ of interest on the abdomen of the patient and then try to place your ports here uh, you will be doing the appendix procedure most commonly in your patients you can see that the appendix is here and you have the two ports right hand side and left hand side on either side of the umbilicus now sometimes appendix is a very simple procedure all you had to do is to pick up the appendix put in a endo loop and then cut the appendix divide the mesentery and take the specimen out it does not involves much of a dissection and lot of times you get patients who are conscious about getting a scar above their waistline so in that kind of scenario you can just shift the two ports below the umbilicus and you can do an off center kind of procedure where the camera port is on the side and the two working ports on the are on the other side of the camera it uh, requires a bit of a, a moment of uh, calibration initially but you get once you get a hang of it you will be able to do the procedure very easily now as i said that we are very uh, fond of drawing the anatomical drawings on the surface of the patient once the patient is prepped it gives a very clear anatomical perspective once you make the drawing on the patient's uh, body so here for example i'll show you the example of uh, multiple procedures here you can see that this is the pylorus we have drawn the pylorus for a hypertrophic pyloric stenosis and we know that our camera port is going to come at the umbilicus we can plan the two ports according to the surface anatomy and once you do that your port placement is going to be very very accurate this is another example for pyeloplasty where we have drawn the distended pelvis and the kidney uh, in the in the lumbar region and then we have placed our port according to the uh, that this is a colloidal cyst patient where again we have made the drawing and then the port placement is made according to that so here we will have a fourth port where uh, it will be used for retraction of the gall bladder so that can also be planned according to the surface drawing which you draw on the patient now this is a complicated patient so here you can see that uh, he has got a, a ganglion neuroma which is appearing as a hot spot on the pet scan it is present at the thoracic inlet level on the right side so this patient we we did this patient laparous thoracoscopically we made the drawings and you can see that we marked the lesion area which is at the level of the thoracic inlet and then we placed our uh, three ports working ports according to the surface anatomy so the entire component of surface anatomy is drawn including the inferior angle of scapula the 12th rib the subcostal margin and the nipple space so it worked out very well in this particular patient and, and we were able to remove the 
neuroblastoma thoracoscopically. This is another patient where uh, we have drawn for, uh, this is a laparoscopic pancreatic jejunostomy for chronic pancreatitis. So you can see the drawing of the colon, the stomach is there. The corresponding operative picture on the, op on the other side you can see here that the stomach is reflected up and the pancreas is exposed and then you are able to do your procedure with maximal efficiency. So all this just helps you to get a perspective of the distances and the entire sort of trigonometry which is going to be there while you are operating the procedure. So we found this uh, very helpful when we were drawing these. There are a lot of uh, conditions where the where it is not possible to place the camera port at the umbilicus. So this is one scenario where you can see that this is a uh, uh, ectopic kidney which is placed just above the bladder. So if you place the camera port uh, at the umbilicus, the working distance is going to be very short. So here we will have to place the camera port which is almost going up to the subcostal level and it is done by the open method. It helps you to give, give, helps you to give the required uh, working distance from the uh, tip of the camera to the organ of interest. On the second picture, uh, you can see that this is a uh, this is a case of a single stage laparoscopic Duhamel pull through. So here the sigmoid is actually very close to the umbilicus because it is distended. So we chose not to place the camera port at the umbilicus and we placed it almost at the subcostal level. So few points about the thoracoscopy. Uh, in thoracoscopy, the operative side is always up and most of the time the position is lateral to semi prone. So in procedures where you want the lung to be as quiet as possible and you want the lung to fall down, you tend to keep the patient more, more and more towards the semi prone position rather than the lateral position. So for situations like when we do a TEF surgery, uh, it is very important to keep the lung down. So the patient is almost in a semi prone position. But for simple scenarios like uh, diaphragmatic hernia or some simple cyst, bronchogenic cyst, in, the, in those kind of scenarios, you can keep the patient lateral. Port's position is very, very variable. In order to understand the port placement inside the chest, since you don't have too much of area to play around, it is easier to divide the chest in the four zones. So the common, commonest zone is the zone towards the diaphragm where you are trying to treat the diaphragmatic hernias and trying to re uh, repair the diaphragmatic defects. Then, uh, so in that case, you will be uh, placing the ports which are as shown in the uh, figure marked by the star icons. And then towards the vertebral column. These are the port placement when you are working towards the mediastinum, say you are removing a bronchogenic cyst or a uh, uh, say a thymus uh, patient. So the first port is always by the open method and then the subsequent port are placed with the help of the finger needle. And uh, here I would emphasize that you need to draw all the surface landmarks but I would never define my ports in terms of say it falls in the posterior axillary line sixth space or anterior axillary line fourth space something like that. It is always that you place the first port, encephalate the chest, bring the diaphragm down, clear off a more bigger area in the lower part and then place these other two ports. So here you can see that I have drawn the line of the uh, diaphragm uh, in the lower part and then I have marked the three ports uh, on the chest. So I will place the upper ports first, most probably it will be the middle port which is done by the open method. Once the chest is in, port is placed here and the chest is encephalated, this diaphragm is going to come down and it will give me an extra space of 2 to 3 uh, intercostal spaces where I can go as low as possible inside the chest. So if I try to place a port without encephalation and try to do the lower port first, I will invariably enter the abdomen or puncture the liver. So this is a very important point when you are placing ports inside the chest. When you are placing the ports in the ab abdomen trans umbilical, I always place the vicral suture at the start itself and use it as a traction suture. You make sure that your port is entering in a perpendicular direction not going in an oblique fashion uh, because other, uh, otherwise it will cause a loss of pivot action and then your five movements are going to be hampered and very commonly after removal of the ports you will have the problem of subcutaneous emphysema in some of the patient. For small patients where the abdominal wall is very supple and you cannot just keep pushing the abdominal wall towards the midline or towards the aorta, you can injure lot of important visceral organs with the tip of the trocar. So one way to avoid is to go port in port where you would just enter the optical port and it uh, comes in line with each other because the two ports are very close to each other and you can align them in a single line. In that way, the tip of the trocar is protected by the other port, sheath of the other port. The various types of ports that are available to you uh, should be thoroughly understood and uh, you need to understand that what kind of valve your port is having. 
So for the metal reusable ports which are there, you can have this uh, ball valve which comes from Wolf. The middle one is the flap valve which comes from stores. The smaller one is a 3mm port which is a valveless port. Then this is a disposable port which has got a rubber flap. It has got a large hub. It, it is sold by Ethicon people. And this is the balloon port which we use very commonly in our setup. So it tucks in, has got a cuff of a balloon and once the balloon is inflated, it uh, it remains there as a self-retaining self -retaining port inside the abdomen and all the problems related to the accidental dislodgement of port which is very common with uh, beginners whenever they are doing their appendix or cholecystectomy. So that problem is almost eliminated with these kind of balloon ports. With the ball valve ports and the flap valve ports, it is very important to understand that the passage of needle is very, very difficult through these ports and most of the time you may end up losing a needle inside the port or losing a needle inside the abdomen. So you have to be very careful. You have to practice uh, outside the abdomen on the trolley itself before you actually push it inside the abdomen in a uh, real case scenario. Optical principles, the light which is illumination which is obtained inside the abdomen is happening through the Hopkins rod lens system and we have the option of 30 degree and 45 degree. One of the principles which I would like to emphasize here, you can see that this is an undecided testis scenario, the o word O is marking the uh, uh, location of the testis. So here you can see that uh, we are looking straight towards the deep inguinal ring and it is not possible to see the testis if you keep looking the way you are doing it. But with a small trick, if you are using a 30 degree beveled scope, if you rotate the light head and keep the camera head steady, you will be able to see in an oblique fashion. So this is demonstrated in this example where you can see that you cannot see the, the number 3 uh, past the obstacle of the trocar. You can see the word 2 and 4. But if you tilt the cable, the bevel tip of the 30 degree camera is going to look past the obstacle and you will be able to see beyond the trocar. So this is just a small example which a camera per person who is holding the camera should know that how to look past the obstacle, you know, past a lobe of a liver which is overhanging you or a ligament which is there in front of you or some other instrument which is coming there in front of you. Now learning hand-eye coordination and depth perception is very important and it has got its own learning curve and uh, there are a lot of things which help you learn and uh, there are a lot of mistakes which the beginners would do. The commonest mistake is that they usually operate with one hand. So they do it unknowingly that whenever they are putting their instrument while they are moving their one hand their other hand stops. So rather than operating with their both hands, they are just moving their one hand and at, at a subconscious level, they are not really aware of that. The other thing which is important is that you have to keep both the tip of the both the instruments in your view so that you can have a better depth of perception and the paradox is reduced. So you have to take into account the paradoxical movement of the instruments, the amount of magnification which is there in, in front of you. And this entire thing takes a bit of a learning and uh, needs some sort of mental calibration which usually comes with experience. So you need to practice this lot on the endo trainers to get the hand-eye coordination. You have to use whatever the tricks that are available with you. So use gravity as your, as your assistant. You forbid the paradoxic movement of the camera and follow the scope line. Add helping or retracting ports. Use parietal wall hitches. Parietal wall hitches are laparoscopic surgeon's best friend. Here one of the example is that you are hitching up the renal pelvis and making it rise above the rest of the abdominal viscera and easing on your uh, procedural difficulties. Suturing again is a, is a, is a very uh, panacea for the beginner laparoscopic surgeon. Most of the time I have seen that the beginner would avoid procedures where a lot of suturing is involved. So even as a beginner, when I was learning laparoscopy, I was using extracorporeal suturing and preformed knots uh, because it was easier for me. So you need to have, you need to do practice on endo trainers on how to put extracorporeal suturing. The intracorporeal suturing follows the principle of C and the reverse C. You need to do it yourself to learn it. Nobody can actually teach you and it is it only comes through the practice. Tools of the trade, energy so are the energy sources which you have. This is an entire chapter in itself. I would not be uh, delving into much of the details over here. The only thing which I would say is that whatever energy sources you have in front of you, you should have a walk through in your mind that uh, at what stage I will be using my energy source and uh, is it ready for me or not. So now there are a lot of procedures which have now become the standard of care in pediatric laparoscopy and uh, these procedures are being very commonly done, appendix, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, non-palpable UDT, fundoplication, nephrectomy, pyeloplasty. So these are the procedures where the it parent is going to come to you and demand for a laparoscopic procedure. So you really need to have to prepare for all these procedures, follow the evolutionary steps of ectomy, otomy and reconstruction. I will detail this in one of the next slides. There are a lot of other procedures 
from these where uh, you know uh, which are very small procedures but will help you train uh, for all the other aspects of laparoscopy other, apart from the actual procedure itself so this is an example where we are doing a lung biopsy so lung biopsy all you have to do is that uh, get inside the chest take a pick up a piece of lung tie a loop of cat gut around it and just cut it and retrieve the specimen so here for a beginner it actually helps you to train and set up for a thoracoscopic procedures he is going to learn how to place a thoracoscopic port he is going to set up himself with the rest of the equipment and then ultimately the actual procedure is, is just a 10 minute procedure it is going to help him gain confidence this is another uh, example where laparoscopy is very useful this is intersusception although it is done in emergency but i would advise all the trainees to attempt intersusception whenever feasible if the bowel is not distended your patient is stable and your supervisor is available uh, with you because here all you have to do is to place your ports get inside the abdomen and detangle the bowel so if it is a reasonably okay length uh, intersusception you will be able to untwine the bowel and you will be sparing the child with a laparotomy here lot of times uh, we have seen that uh, there is a diagnosis of intersusception and once you open the abdomen the uh, intersusception is not there or it has reduced itself while you have been delivering the bowel so if you have attempted this procedure laparoscopically you would have saved the patient from a laparotomy insertion and it is very satisfying with all the procedures and the details which i have enumerated uh, in this presentation i would always divide them into four level procedures for a beginner you know when you are doing dealing with your basics getting your hardware right learning when you are learning about the ports you always attempt the simpler procedures such as lap coli appendix cyst excision shunt placement hernia we have done a few vesicle stone where we have gone inside the pelvis open slit open the bladder laparoscopically and retrieve the stone and then close the bladder with a few stitches it is a very good practice exercise for uh, beginners to learn uh, suturing inside the abdomen once you are comfortable with this these level 1 procedures you you can escalate yourself towards a high, a level 2 procedures which are lap nephrectomy fundoplication and intestinal resection we have done a few intestinal resections for vascular malformations the level 3 after this will include the reconstructive procedures such as pyeloplasty pyeloplasty involves lot of suturing and uh, handling delicate handling of the pelvis and the ureter uh, and and requires a, a, a definite amount of learning colloidal cyst is another one where lot of dissection around important vascular structures is involved and uh, uh, requires a reasonable learning level 4 are the procedures which are at the apex and the experienced surgeons are doing them these are the neonatal procedures where you are doing a diaphragmatic hernia in a neonate tf repair in a neonate esophageal reconstructions and other uh, procedures so if you if you keep your learning in a step wise fashion and with every procedure you better yourself and you try to uh, you know you know evolve with the entire learning procedure have a team learning sort of thing because it's not like that you learn alone and then you would be able to proceed to directly to level 4 procedures your team has to learn with you your assistant has to learn with you your scrub nurse has to learn with you and even your anesthetist has to lo learn with you it is only then you will be able to attempt the level 4 procedures so during this journey there will be lot of complications stroke or injuries energy source related injuries port side problems hernia infection hemorrhage and most importantly whatever you have done it has not worked out so say you have done a pyeloplasty but still there is obstructed drainage on your renal scans so that is something which is counted as a complication and you may have to redo the entire procedure and there will be always a few patients of these sorts which will be there in front of you during your learning curve the only thing which is going to matter is that if you improve with every patient and you have a learning with every patient you are definitely going to be a good surgeon one day so at the end of the day i would say that it is a snake and ladder game where you can have a good run you can have you can get all the ladders in front of you and and you keep climbing there can be a day when when you are doing that same procedure for almost 50th time and then in your 51th patient you will have a very drastic complication so that is when you have landed on the spot of a snake head and then he eats you and brings you down to a lower level especially on your confidence level so it is up to you how you take this entire game how you learn your procedure and how you train your team so with that i end my procedure i again thank the entire set of organizers the chairpersons for giving me time to present this uh, in front of all our trainees thank you very much